Historically, fighting games have been a pretty straightforward concept to pitch to a player. Beat up your opponent until their life reaches zero. It's simple and direct with little to no room for misinterpretation. But as these games evolved, new characters were added and game plans had to be innovated to keep them feeling fresh and new. A typical means of implementing such step is adding an extra quote-unquote step to a character that helps enhance their overall game state. This ranges from making them do more damage, applying some sort of detriment to their opponent, or somehow doing damage to the opponent over time. When watching characters like this, it's hard not to feel like you're watching something out of an RPG. And while I was experimenting with this, I got to thinking, how far can concepts like this really go in this genre? What is the absolute limit for status effects in fighting games? Before getting too deep into the video, I just want to say thanks for helping me grow the channel up to this point if you're subscribed. If not, and you want to support what I do, please subscribe and leave a like since it helps more than you might know. This video is thanks to the viewers, so if you leave a comment down below, I might just make that the next video topic. You never know. Alright, back to status effects. In my experience, status effects are actually quite weak for two reasons. The first being that you almost always see them on two-step characters. Inherently, these types of characters have to trigger something in order to reach the best versions of themselves, whereas strong characters are consistently the best versions of themselves already. Secondly, status effects tend to be inconsequential because developers fear taking them too far. It's not difficult to imagine a world where a status effect is overtuned and players can let it do the winning for them, which would destroy the balance and fun of the game altogether. In fact, we saw exactly this in a major fighting game release already. Go. I'm character of peace here. And look at this mirror match, guys. I'm not feeling it personally. <laughs> Everyone, everyone's favorite. Everyone's oh, favorite. I know everyone okay. in the chat is hyped when this mirror match happens. <laughs> Lab Coat versus Lab Coat. The crowd goes mild. Lab Coat 21 is the last DLC character added to Dragon Ball Fighters, and on release, she objectively broke the game. She had the ability to reduce her opponent's damage by 21% by using an almost unreactable, invincible command grab super. Yeah, let me debuff you real quick. Yeah, nice combo, bro. Hold nice on. Combo, bro. I got you, I got you. Hold on, do it again now before, like, <laughs> for 80% damage. If you got hit and she had one bar, that character was almost useless unless you also had a lab coat on your team. This debuff was permanent too, by the way, and there was no way to get rid of it, and it really just was not fun to play against or watch. It got so bad that she was even banned from CEO of 2022. Looking back, such an approach to game design is honestly laughable when you consider no game would ever want something like this near it. It would be like coming across some incurable debuff in an RPG and just having to deal with it for the rest of the game, or hope you never have to interact with it in the first place. However, there are plenty of cases of other fighting games using debuffs like this and making it make sense. The question is, does he put the debuff on him or not? That is what we're looking for. We're gonna see so many of these break counters. It's just gonna happen. Like, let's not even pretend. Oh, the double with yeah. the air shimmy right there. And because Koji Koko was debuffed by the icicle, that means the throw had more recovery. Right. So it was okay. easier yeah, to punish. Yeah. If that was a regular throw whip, Lancelot would not have been able to connect with a whip. That makes a lot of sense. Lab Code 21 was a great example of what not to do. Let's look at some games that got this debuff idea right. To quickly define it, a debuff in my definition are effects that restrict the opponent without directly damaging their life gauge. For example, Chizuru from KOF 15 is able to seal her opponents when she uses one of her supers, effectively casting Silence. When sealed, Players can't use any specials, meaning she can restrict the use of reversals of any kind, guaranteeing her a follow-up. Finish the job here. Sace oh. has to be careful, finds a hit, goes all the way in. Oh, all the way in as we're going to SDM, lock you down. But again, Geese does not care, can still use his meter for guard cancels just like that. Gets out of the corner. Of course, something like this would be utterly broken if it lasted the entire round, so instead, the effect only lasts between 5 and 7 seconds, guaranteeing one or two mix-ups at most, 
depending on the situation. Jay-Z's defense coming into full effect at the moment, and you see, uh, again, like, full screen, baby. he's just yep. not able to get any clean hits on this Chizuru. Yeah, that's going to be rough. Now you're sealed. You got one more touch to your name. Oh, my God. You did not want to be in this situation. And just like that, ZJZ snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. Looking back a bit further, Beautiful Joe in Marvel 3 has something pretty similar where he can slow his opponents down for 10 seconds. This effect pretty much forces them to tag out or deal with it, risking big damage because they suffer more hit stun on slowdown. When slowed, it's not that difficult for Beautiful Joe to two-touch whoever he has in his sights. Such a powerful debuff in a game as fast as Marvel is pretty much a death sentence and it's honestly a really interesting take on a pretty common status effect. In fact, doing the research for this video, I found that it's one of the most common in fighting games too. But instead, he's got to deal with Curse. Yeah, so let's Mix see. up hits, got reset number two. Into the corner. Oh, that's Fame a Fame with the blocks. Good blocks. Oh my goodness. Living on a prayer, but Fame gets opened up by the low. We're going to see the curse coming through again for Soji. And he's got a 100 meter. This is yeah, looking oh like the life. end of Fame's life. That is what we call optimally. Oh, blue beam. Oh, E-Tex out, though. Oh, got hit with a counter hit. Arakune from Blaze Blue is a fantastic example of a two-step character as he doesn't get access to his best moves until he's built up enough of his curse meter. Once the meter is full though, his mix becomes some of the most deadly in the game. This is because of the attributes of his status effects. Plus or minus B is a move that summons a homing cloud that restricts opponents' horizontal movements when it gets a hold of them. Characters can still jump and use movement options while cursed, but generally this allows Arakune to lock them down and loop some of the most insane pressure I've ever seen. On the plus side, Curse isn't indefinite and if you can weather the storm, you can break free of his pressure and start your own offense and that's incredibly important with status effects like this. Unlike with Android 21, you want there to be counterplay in areas where it matters, but you still want these techniques to be powerful so players actually want to use them. One way to encourage players to interact with effects more is to make their significance a bit more prominent and easier to access. These types I'll refer to as ailments. Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> ailments, unlike debuffs, actually can do direct damage to the opponents like burn, shock, and poison. Valentine from Skullgirls actually can use both debuffs and ailments. Her Vile Hazard special has three varieties. Type C increases the input lag of her opponent up to 9 frames. Type B increases the hit stun of her attacks, giving her new combos that she wouldn't normally have. And Type A is a fighting game classic, Poison, which works exactly as it sounds. Is that exactly what it sounds like? Poison is easy to implement in fighting games because it simply consists of passively draining an opponent's health. In pretty much every example I can think of, once you poison an opponent, it will last until you get hit, which promotes keeping the enemy away or running the clock with long combos and animations. When designing poison into a fighting game, it definitely takes a lot of balancing as passive damage can easily make or break a game if you're not careful. That's standing strong, remember, also got two more active frames, mm. so it checks things a lot better. Oh, he could die, he's dead here. Yeah. He's dead here. He could be able to extend Full there combo. Here. Level one, there take him to the sky. Broski. Put him in the bubble. Broski. When designing Fong for Street Fighter V, Capcom ran into this problem numerous times as he was either way too powerful or overall underwhelming depending on how they tuned his poison mechanics. And even Dalsum's V-Trigger 1, which only dealt passive damage, was probably one of the best V-Triggers in the entire game, helping him maintain that top tier status. Ailments like this are harder to balance, in my opinion, because of the fact that they can damage an opponent's health directly. They're also a bit less dynamic than debuffs since they don't actually affect the core gameplay of the character. Some characters do have that extra deep interaction with their ailments, but overall, it's quite rare. So, even with all of that said, I'm not truly satisfied. I want to find a game where the core gameplay revolves around status effects. It sounds ridiculous, I know, 
There's been tons of games with many effects in it, like Arcana Heart or Persona 4 Arena, but those are mainly based on characters themselves. I want a fighting game that can restrict or unleash how players interact with it in creative ways that we don't see in other fighting games. I searched and searched through countless games, old and new, to try and figure out what might reach this requirement, but after a while, I realized the answer's been staring me in the face this whole time. <laughs> this is Toho Hisotensoku, or Soku for short. It's a fast-paced anime, bullet-hell, card-based, weather-dependent fighting game. If that all sounds like a meme, it's because it kind of is. Soku is the 12.3rd or 12.3 or game number 12.3 in the Toho Project franchise. This is alien. We're going in. It's the 12.3rd Toho Project Seito Sensoku or whatever the fuck this one's called. These games are mostly bullet hells with insanely chaotic mechanics and gameplay. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some mechanics and how the game works, but if you're curious after finishing this video, make sure you check out this starter guide as it tells you pretty much everything you need to know to get into the game. Just by watching it, it's obvious that Soku isn't like any traditional fighting game you've ever played. For a brief rundown of what's happening, every character in the game has access to unique movement options of flight, air dashing, jumping, and other special abilities. Within that movement is a property called grazing. Grazing is what allows characters to dash in and out projectiles the way that they do, but it loses to melee attacks. Bullets are the projectiles characters use to cover the screen in total chaos, and they're what makes Soku so special in the first place. Lastly, melee attacks are great to use when you're up close since you can't melee while grazing, and it generally loses to the projectile properties of bullets. So with all of that said, neutral in Soku is kind of similar to that of Dragon Ball Fighters, but there are a lot more nuanced interactions than just Super Dash losing to 2H. If I wanted to explain more than I just did about this game, it really would need its own video. So let's move on to the topic at hand. Yes, to the matter at hand. How does Toho use status effects? Well, Status effects in this game are not tied to any specific characters. Instead, they're connected to an overall game mechanic called the weather cycle. At the top of the screen is a timer, just like you'd see in any fighting game, but notice that it counts up, not down. That's because the timer in Soku isn't like any other clock. What it's counting to is the next phase in the weather cycle. In this game, every match starts with clear weather. As certain conditions like wall bounces, knockdowns, and card usage are met, the cycle will move forward one weather condition. Each condition has its own unique effect, and players have to juggle their own resources while keeping track of where they are in the cycle and what's happened in that period of time. I've seen some of the most insane interactions I've ever seen in fighting games happen back to back to back in Soku. The awareness of the players and the space to freely express yourself in the moment is honestly unmatched in any other anime fighter that I've seen. Here's a quick example. The weather typhoon triggers a game state in which blocking is impossible. Characters are harder to stagger, but when typhoon starts, players usually just start going at each other with no regards for defense. It's a pretty unique status, but it can get even crazier. This weather is Aurora. So Aurora is kind of the Mario Party of the weathers. It will choose one random weather and then copy its effects. Uh, you can't really tell what kind of weather it is unless the effect is obvious. Like Typhoon, people will just instantly start stop blocking yeah. and start getting hit by random stuff. Here's what happens if you get Aurora and Typhoon together. Conversion gets that good, good sip in there. Okay, nice. Oh, it's Typhoon, Aurora Typhoon! Aurora Typhoon, Daikatana! Get out right, of there, man! Go, get go, out go. there! Come, Daikatana! Right, oh. <laughs> That's a pretty dumb but funny example of what this game is capable of. But to show you what really makes this game special, let's take a look at this example. The Sakuya player here notices that the next weather system coming is going to be calm. 
Calm rewards the first player to score a knockdown with the healing spotlight that remains on them until they're knocked down themselves. Upon noticing this, he uses his time slow super to slow down the timer leading up to Calm and lands an ambiguous mix-up the very second time returns to normal, which guarantees himself the healing glow from the Calm weather. This very interaction is one of the most layered things I've ever seen, something I've praised from games like Uni or Samshou in the past, and it happens literally every single match in Toho Hisotensoku. These kinds of things are so common, in fact, the commentators didn't even really seem to notice or care. Just, wow, what a game this is. All of this is to say that fighting games take inspiration from literally everywhere, and even for someone like me who's been diving deep into these games for a year now, there's so much that I don't know. I only learned about Soku because of you guys. So many people commented under my analyses of time and RNG that I felt this was due. If you guys want a dedicated Soku video in the future, please let me know because I'd love to talk more with the community and dive deeper into this game. I think that's it. I think that's everybody. That I everybody. think that's everybody. Amazing! I didn't know you were such a good juggler! I should have said juggler. What? If you've made it this far into the video, thanks so much for watching, and I really hope you enjoyed. If you want to support what I do, I started a Patreon for those who want to interact with my content just a little bit more. Every month, I'll post a short playlist of music that will include some hints about content coming up in the future, and I'll open up some discussion about ideas that we might be able to explore together when it comes to fighting games. So, once again, thanks for watching, and if you have any suggestions for future videos or ideas you want to talk about, leave them in the comments, and with that, I'll see you in the next one.